My name is Curtis Nickel, a urologist and professor of urology at Queen's University, Kingston, Canada, and Canada Research Chair in Urologic Infection, Inflammation, and Pain. I am presenting a three-part series as an introduction to the urinary microbiome. Part one was a primer on microbiome in general and the urinary microbiome specifically. In part two, we examined how the urinary microbiome impacts or is at least associated with urologic disease. In this final part three, I will present an introduction on how we can manipulate our microbiome for urologic health. We have learned using state-of-the-art, next-generation sequencing, and other novel technology that the urinary tract is not sterile, but in fact, a veritable microbial jungle. We now know that there can be as many as 4,000 different species within the urinary tract of healthy and infected individuals. We understand that the microbiome impacts urologic disease. It's associated in some respect with the severity of chronic urologic pelvic pain syndromes, such as interstitial cystitis, bladder pain syndrome, and chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, and Hunter lesions. We know that it is also associated with lower urinary tract symptoms in both men and women, with urinary stones, both infected and non-infected, and it looks like it could be associated or involved with urologic malignancy. So the main ways or methods that we can manipulate our urinary microbiome are illustrated in this very simple slide. Now, diet profoundly impacts our individual ur urinary microbiome, but also our population-based urinary microbiome, our microbiome in general. In fact, the major change was at the time of the agricultural revolution, when we went from hunter-gatherers to farmers, then for eons, there was probably very little change in the microbiome, but it was dependent on the type of crops or uh, food that was eaten. That changed in the Industrial Revolution, where we ended up in cities, not only with pollution, but with different and less diverse and probably less healthy diet. So diet itself is has a profound impact on our microbiome, both gut and likely urinary. Uh, and it probably accounts for most of the major individual differences we see in uh, subjects, both in disease and in health. Now, we've recently found that exercise, which we know is good for our human organs and human systems, is also excellent for our microbiome and keeping it healthy. Environmental pollution has to be, although it's difficult to prove, has to be a major influencer on our microbiome. And it's a good idea probably to avoid as much environmental pollution as we can, because remember, we're in this together. Our microbiome is in there with us. They want their host to survive, and we want our microbiome to be healthy. But by far, the largest impact on the human microbiome was the introduction of antibiotics in the last century. Antibiotics have made major, major changes in human microbiome, likely related to significantly decreased diversity, probably dysbiosis or a very bad ecology, and it by itself probably has as much or more impact in individual microbiomes as diet itself. As far as urinary stone disease uh, is concerned, we could consider, and it is being considered, gastrointestinal recolonization with uh, O uh, formagenes and other bacteria that um, are 
involved in the oxalate mechanism. We're just learning how to disrupt bacterial biofilms in various disease states, and that'll certainly help for uh, bacteria associated with stones, such as struvite stones. And if we can manipulate the mechanistic effect of bacteria within the urinary tract in stone formation, but this will only come with more knowledge on how that actually works. As far as cath uh, cancer management, right now, what, we can, what can we do to manipulate our microbiome? Well, we can promote a healthy anti-tumorigenic microbiome through diet and avoidance of antibiotics. We are looking for microbiota-based markers for cancer risk or detection. We're trying to determine, as has been shown in bladder cancer, which microbiome pattern enhances treatment success. And we want to target microbiota which might bypass treatment-resistant mechanism tumor cells. These are all important considerations. None of them, except for the first one, really realistic in 2020. Now, the model for cancer management using bacteria has always been BCG. Alvaro Morales, my mentor and professor at Queen's University. In fact, uh, I transi transitioned into his office space when uh, he moved uh, and retired. Uh, this continues after 40 years as a recommended therapy for early stage superficial urothelial bladder cancer. What we need to do is what else can we manipulate in terms of our bacterial friends uh, for cancer prevention and treatment? This is going to be the focus of much research over the next little while. Probiotics for UTIs, particularly the use of lactobacillus, is controversial primarily because of the mode of administration, whether it's oral, intervaginal, in the bladder, and the species that are the best. But we're learning, and trials have shown that lactobacillus as a probiotic may be very helpful in preventing urinary tract infections, particularly those with recurrent urinary tract infections and patients subjected to long and many courses of antimicrobial therapy. Or we can go the next step, something that is um, very little science right now, Certainly a lot of uh, uh, commercialization and fortunes that are certainly being made is in the field of prebiotics. In other words, feed our friends and starve our enemies. Hopefully, at some point, the science will catch up with the hype and we'll actually know what foods or prebiotics we need to be able to promote the good bacteria and the microbiomes that we want to see in our urinary tract. Now, fecal transplantation has been used in Clostridium uh, difficile infections for a little while and has been extremely successful. In other words, can disrupt and get rid of the bowel microbiome and then reintroduce a, uh, a new microbiome a healthier microbiome without the uropathogens. Well, what's interesting is that those patients who had recurrent urinary tract infections and were treated with antibiotics, ended up with C. difficile infection, treated with a fecal transplant, had a significant reduction in their UTIs. Interesting that the bowel microbiome is influencing what's going on in the bladder. We now know that the bowel microbiome talks to the bladder microbiome to various mechanisms. It's probably bi-directional as well with the bladder uh, talking to the bowel as well through neuroendocrine processes, but also maybe through the introitus, vagina, and urethra possibly as well. Now, we know that we do not want to treat asymptomatic bacteria. Studies have actually shown that asymptomatic bacteria, in other words, a microbiome of uropathogenic looking bugs in the bladder with no symptoms or inflammation is protective against recurrent cystitis. Treating that asymptomatic bacteria just because there's an E. coli or Klebsiella in the bladder with no symptoms leads to recurrent symptomatic cystitis. 
So in other words, our uropathogens are not all bad. Some of them are not pathogenic at all, but actually protective. And we've got to remember that when we're treating culture results or even next generation sequencing results, and we see what we believe is a uropathogen, particularly in asymptomatic patients. Now, work has been done in a number of uh, Scandinavian studies on urine transplantation. Urine transplantation using an E. coli that does not cause a symptomatic inflammation or infection does protect patients with recurrent UTI. Right now, this is probably best for patients with recurrent UTIs and neurogenic bladder, but it may also help patients with recurrent and other chronic UTIs. I believe this is going to be a very important um, study focus in the near future. Now, phage therapy, in which we use these viral type products to attack bacteria. They eat bacteria for dinner. And what we want to do is find phage that go after specific uropathogens. Right now, we're using it for more uh, severe systemic therapy with some success. We have to find specific phage for specific bacteria. Now, it was interesting. I was making up this slide, and my grandson, Dawson, was peering over uh, my uh, uh, shoulder, and he made a reference to some Star Wars creature that I had never heard of. Uh, the Imperial Walker. So I had to look it up. And yeah, Dawson, that kind of does look like the Imperial Walker. Maybe something of the future. Fage Wars just might, in fact, be the, the next um, battleground for serious and significant infections, including urinary tract infections. I'm presently working on a immune uh, immunotherapy approach to recurrent UTI using uh, a sublingual root oral vaccine that has been shown through um, innate and adaptive immunity responses in the sublingual mucosa to create a uh, response in the urethra and bladder mucosa. There are a number of studies in this uh, using this and it looks very good. We have just completed a uh, European placebo-controlled, randomized uh, uh, controlled trial, and we're presently analyzing the results. If positive, and I believe all indications will be based on the other studies, that it will be positive, this will be a game breaker. Presently, we are the only institution in North America that is using this vaccine uh, in an early uh, clinical experience study. And with no, very few side effects or almost no side effects, we are seeing excellent results. I believe that you'll hear more about this within the next year or so. So what's happening out there? Our patients are sending their urines to various companies for next generation sequencing and they're getting back very complicated reports. They're getting comprehensive uh, screening using PCR and NGS we're getting complete resistant gene data. Some of them use rapid screening, overall antibiotic resistance summaries, and we end up with these very sophisticated reports. Right now, it is very difficult for us to figure out how to use this, except in patients who are symptomatic, and we see a specific predominance of uropathogens that could be causing this, then we can treat those specifically with antibiotics, um, and if they get better, I, I, I think this might be the way of the future. And other, other ones, other investigators believe that it is in fact time to dump the Petri dish. Uh, right now in 2020, we still rely on laboratory uh, culture, but soon there will be a case for culture independent uro uh, urology for the treatment of urinary tract infections particularly when we know more about the normal urobiome and we know more about the abnormal urobiome associated with urologic disease. So back to our slide, friend or foe, 
we don't always have to kill off the bacteria, even the seemingly uropathogenic bacteria within our microbiome. We do have to understand what a normal microbiome looks like, and we do have to try and figure out how the microbiome is changed or different in various disease states. Only then will we will we be able to manipulate our microbiome so that we, the host and the microbiome, can be friends and live in harmony together. So right now in 2020, this is all we really have right now practically is a diet, a bladder friendly diet, which is very similar to a heart friendly diet, exercise, avoid as much environmental pollution as we can, and above all, avoid the injudicious use of antimicrobials. Now, in this uh, series of lectures, we have covered the field, the primer, talked about the microbiome, its impact on neurologic disease, and what we can actually do to manipulate it. We, over the next little while, and we already have online and uh, ran rounds in urology, a number of specific lectures looking at depth in these various uh, topics. Please go to those topics if you're interested, enjoy and learn. Thank you.